space. It is always gratifying to be able to put into, into law. Let me say that again. To see your ideas put into law to help Californians be, become more safe. Um, I will kick it off by thanking the governor for signing my, my act, the Peace Act, the Peace Officers Education and Age Conditions for Employment Act, also known as the Peace Act, AB 89. Relying on decades of data showcasing more mature and better educated officers are less reliant on excessive force. Once signed on January 1st, 2022, the minimum age, oops, got to take this off. The minimum age for incoming officers will increase from 18 years to 21 years of age, aligned with that of other law enforcement agencies, as well as the legal age to possess a firearm in a state. In addition, the Peace Act requires experts from the California Community Colleges, alongside advisors from law enforcement, higher education, uh, faculty, community advocates, to develop the framework for officers to achieve higher education. An education that will include the following, psychology, communications, history, ethnic studies, law, and those in critical thinking and emotional intelligence. The, this framework will equip officers with the skills necessary for de-escalation, while also guaranteeing they develop an understanding of the history of communities from diverse backgrounds and cultures, and by partnering with one of the best tuition-free community colleges systems in the nation, we will develop the model for a financial aid program to support students of low income and underrepresented backgrounds so they could join the policing profession, and that this workforce, most important, this workforce will reflect the communities they, they serve. My community, like others, is all too familiar with police violence and physical force. This bill relies on years of study and new understandings of brain development to ensure that only those officers capable of high-level decision-making and judgment in tense situations are entrusted in working in our communities. Just raising the age from 18 to 21, as most women will tell you, most men don't mature until they're 30. So just raising it from 18 20 to 21 will have a drastic improvement. In addition, I'm in a doctoral program at the University of Southern California, Price School, and this is part of my thesis, reinventing and revitalizing law enforcement. And so these bills, all four of them, will be an integral part of our study and empirical peer review and study so we can not only implement it, we will also begin to study their effectiveness. I would, I would like to once again thank Governor Newsom for signing this timely piece of uh, legislation into law and give a thank you to the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, California Faculty Association, and the California Police Chiefs. I don't think we've ever had a partnership where we've had advocates, police chiefs, and educators all coming together to do the best they can for public safety, a matter of fact, for any type of uh, cause. And so that's why as we move forward and we design the framework for what this educational um, opportunity will be, it should be the best, not only in California, but hopefully become the benchmark for what we do nationally. My colleague, in addition, my colleague, uh, Assemblymember Gibson, could not be here today. And if you just allow me just a few more minutes, um, I'd like to speak on behalf of his bill. Uh, Mr. Gibson, as we speak, is now in Colorado, being a voice for California Vice Chair and co-host of the Council of State Government 74th Western Annual Meeting. For my colleague, I also want to thank Governor Newsom for his signature of AB 490, which bans uh, law enforcement from using restraints that cause positional asphyxiation a deadly condition that can occur when a person is restrained and cannot breathe. While many of us witnessed the untimely death of George Floyd last year, Angela, Angelo Quinto, a native veteran from Northern California, also lost his life at the hands of law enforcement when used similar restraints. This new law will not hinder, and I repeat, will not hinder law enforcement from utilizing restraints they might need to use in dangerous situations and keep themselves protected, but it will place 
a limit on those restraints as to not keep someone from be breathing and the result be an unnecessary death. AB 490 helps close a legal loophole in current law for use of force policies to prevent any family from having to go through what George Floyd's and Angelo Quinto's loved ones were forced to. We empathize and we want to recognize um, the Angelo, Angelo's family who have joined us today um, for their tireless advocacy. And if they would just stand, as I call their names, David Hershield. Is he here? Oh, he's taking pictures behind. Uh, Diana Puente, aunt of Angelo Quinto. Robert Collins, stepfather of Angelo Quinto. Andre Quinto, brother of Angelo Quinto. Isabella Quinto, sister of Angelo Quinto. And of course, the mother of Angelo Quinto, Cassandra Quinto Collins. We should all give them a hand. And, and thank you. And now we'd like to bring to the podium uh, Assembly Member Chris Holden. Good morning. I'd like to thank Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer, uh, Senator Steve Bradford, as the chairs of, respectfully, of the Public Safety Committee for the California State Legislature. I appreciate their input and guidance as they worked with me on AB 26, Duty to Intervene. I also want to acknowledge all of our community partners and supporters, the various organizations and law enforcement for working with me to deliver AB 26, the George Floyd Bill, to Governor Gavin Newsom. I thank the governor for helping California meet the moment in ensuring that Californians know their rights as well as when a peace officer is intervening based on the techniques considered in this bill. It is a bittersweet moment today. On the one hand, we are all dismayed by the tragic events that led to the untimely death of George Floyd. On the other hand, we are standing here today with legislation aimed at strengthening our current law, which requires that peace officers have a duty to intervene. As many of you know, law enforcement across the country have condemned the actions of the supervising officer involved in that incident. That is not what AB 26 is about. Derek Chauvin, the supervising officer, was charged with the killing of George Floyd. But the justice for George Floyd doesn't rest in his conviction. The protests and demonstrations that we witnessed throughout the country were not singularly focused on just the actions of the supervising officer. No, the demonstrations and the demonstrators were also protesting the fact that the three additional officers simply stood by and watched as he died. That is what AB 26 is about. Minnesota, like California, has policy that an officer has a duty to intervene. However, the problem is not that nothing in our is that nothing in our current law explains or establishes when in fact a peace officer has intervened. Absent of this understanding, it leaves the public uninformed and law enforcement the ability to define intervention at whatever each individual police officer deems it to be. To address this ambiguity, last year I introduced Assembly Bill 1022 to establish two things. One, what it means for a peace officer to intervene when witnessing an excessive use of force by another peace officer. And two, certain outcomes for failure to intervene. While that piece of legislation did not make it to Governor Newsom's desk to meet the moment, despite overwhelming community and organizational support, AB 26 delivers on my belief that the public has a right to know what measures need to be taken to establish an officer has attempted to intervene. AB 26 clarifies and establishes intervention to include, but not limited to, 
the use of de-escalation techniques, confronting the officer, applying excessive use of force, physically stopping the excessive use of force when in a position to do so, recording and documenting the incident in real time with body cameras, and reporting the incident to dispatch or watch commander in real time stating the officer's name, unit, location, time, and situation in order to establish that an attempt to intervene has been made. Additionally, it requires a peace officer to report the incident immediately to his or her supervisor. AB 26 prohibits retaliation on a police officer for reporting an incident. It prohibits an officer from training other officers for a period of at least three years from the date that an excessive use of force complaint is substantiated. Finally, AB 26 requires that an officer who fails to intervene be disciplined up and including in the same manner as an officer who used excessive force. And that final point is critical. It is critical because it means that an officer it means that once Senator Steve Bradford's SB2 police decertification bill is signed, a peace officer could have his or her certification suspended or revoked if the officer failed to intervene. AB 26 provides us with the opportunity to build more trust between police officers and the communities that they serve. At this time, I'd like to call to the podium a good friend of mine and our Attorney General, Attorney General Rob Bonner. Well, good morning, and thank you, Assemblymember Holden, for uh, that very kind introduction. Thank you to the Governor for his courageous and values-based leadership and for bringing us together today. Again, I'm Attorney General Rob Bonta, and today is a special day. Today, in my view, is an inflection point. Today, we witness history get signed into law. And today, we embark on a new chapter in which we infuse our criminal justice system with more trust, with more transparency, and with more accountability. And California rightfully prides itself in leading on so many things, from climate action to reproductive freedom, gun safety, healthcare access, economic opportunity. And today, with these forward-leaning laws, we lead again. And we lead in the criminal justice reform space. And, you know, we are in a crisis of trust when it comes to law enforcement right now, across the state, across the nation. And we need more tools, uh, better tools, to create more transparency, more oversight, and more accountability. And uh, today, we're delivering concrete solutions from banning dangerous holds that lead to asphyxia, to multiple other mechanisms that improve accountability and oversight and transparency. And, and with these laws, we are showing that you can build trust with the public and enhance the safety of our community and our officers at the same time, that they are not mutually exclusive, that in fact, they are reinforcing. That by building trust today, uh, we enhance safety for our officers and for our community tomorrow. Trust generates safety, and safety generates trust. So uh, today, for me, is a day for uh, gratitude and thanks. Let me first thank uh, all the legislators who are here and who are not here, who authored this incredible set of bills that they should be very proud of, and I'm proud of them uh, for it as a Californian, as a former legislator who uh, proudly work with uh, my colleagues behind me. I'm thankful for what they've done, and I know how hard it is. These are not easy bills. These are bills that require courage, that require commitment, um, and that require a lot of skill to get them passed, so I thank them. 
I also want to thank Governor Newsom again for his foresight, for his vision, for his courage in, in signing these bills. I want to give a special shout out to uh, and, and, and deep expression of gratitude to impacted families and loved ones who have suffered uh, unspeakable and unbearable loss, pain and tragedy, and have shown courage and resilience in fortitude in pushing forward and turning that pain into meaningful and transformational change. And let me take a, a point of personal privilege here to thank the Quinto family and David Hochschild for your trust of me and for allowing me to work with you. I know this journey is long, but this is an important step in the journey today, and I'm proud to stand uh, with you. And perhaps most importantly, I want to thank the people of California and the people of this nation who, in the middle of an international pandemic, rose up, spoke up, and spoke out, and demanded more accountability, demanded more justice, demanded change. And today, we are answering that call for justice with these monumental steps forward. So I'm proud of California today. And as California's Attorney General, I see and value and will protect every community and look forward to the ongoing work ahead. And with that, let me introduce uh, my former colleague and always friend, Senator Steve Bradford. Thank you, Attorney General Bonta. I first want to thank each and every one of you who've come here today. It's bittersweet. It's bitter because of the circumstances that brought us here today, the unnecessary loss of lives due to rogue policing here in California. But it's sweet because we have a governor who has recognized that change is needed. We have a legislative body who recognizes that change is needed and law enforcement. I'm honored to author SB2, Police Decertification, better known as the Kenneth Ross Jr. Initiative. Kenneth Ross Jr. was a young man who grew up right here in this neighborhood, whose home abutted this park. And you say, why are we here at this park today? It's because right here at this park is where Kenneth Ross Jr. lost his life. So we're here to recognize him. It was three years ago, a young man who was simply running across the park having some issues, and instead of sending a crisis team, he was shot in the back and killed in broad daylight by an officer who really had no business being here in the city of Gardena. And the reason I say that is because I've lived here 52 years, grew up as a kid, and I knew every officer by personal first name, and when I heard about the shooting, I did not know who this officer was. And the reason why is because he transferred from Orange County after being involved in three questionable shootings there. SB2 is the type of legislation that will make sure the wash, rinse, and repeat cycle that is happening in California where an officer can commit a crime and quit before being fired or even be fired, get hired by another agency. We have numerous examples of officers who have engaged in misconduct, who have either been fired or left the department, as I stated, and then take their misconduct to another community. This is unfair to all these families. It's unfair to the communities as a whole. We saw this happen a few weeks ago, here in my district as well, in the city of Torrance, where two officers were fired last year, and 11 others were walked out of the department for vandalism and racist behavior and brutality. The two officers who were charged that left the department last year, but without strong decertification process, they were able to be hired by another department and continue their racist and hateful misconduct in another community. They are working now today. Had SB2 been in place, those guys would not have been hired. If these officers were not good enough for Torrance, they shouldn't be good enough for any other community here in the state of California. SB2 will end the cycle of what I said, the wash, rinse, and repeat cycle of police misconduct and ensure all officers in California are held to the same fair and appropriate standards. This bill has been a priority of mine for over a year, uh, and more so following last year's nationwide call for police reform. 
As many might know, I introduced SB 731 last year, and we weren't unable, due to the truncated legislative session and heavy, heavy lobbying by uh, police unions, to get that to the floor. And so we huddled back up, the pro tem and I, Senator Tony Atkins, who I have to recognize as the joint author on this legislation, and she said, we're coming back with a new bill, and that's what SB2 is all about. This bill is not just about holding bad officers accountable for their misconduct, it's also about rebuilding trust between our communities and law enforcement, and that's critical right now. As we will know, many times it says black and brown people hate the police. We don't hate the police. We fear the police. We fear the police due to lack of trust. This will help establish trust. No one should fear the police when they call 911 or encounter an officer, that their call for help will be met by a bad officer who can turn that emergency into a potential tragedy. We must trust the state to develop standards to ensure we have the best doctors, the best lawyers, the best contractors, even the best elected officials and teachers the same should apply to law enforcement. It is time that California joins the other 46 states to ensure that we hold police officers to the same high standards as well. Again, I want to thank the governor, Newsom, for signing this bill and the three others that you heard today, and for having California continue to lead in police reform and criminal justice, as well as his legislative office for their diligently working with us the past, uh, over the past few months. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Jessica on the governor's staff who put in tremendous hours of negotiation to get us where we, here, where we are today. Senator President Pro Tem Tony Atkins could not be here, but she sends her regard. She's the joint author on this bill, but I want to recognize Amy Alley, her right-hand person who worked on this bill. Give Amy Alley a round of applause because she lived and breathed this bill. But we as legislators far too often get credit for the legislation that has passed, but it's really the diligent staff work. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the young man for the last year and a half who has let this bill be his life in, his, in my office, a young man who came to me as a fellow two years ago and had an incredible work ethic, none other than Chris Morales. Give this young man a round of applause for his incredible work. I want to thank all the co-authors as well, uh, as members uh, of the, and also members of the Legislative Black Caucus, which I chair. This was a priority bill for the Legislative Black Caucus. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize some of the amazing community advocates who worked with us nonstop to make sure we had a product that we can all be proud of. LA Voices, Tina McKenna, Black Lives Matter, Dr. <laughs> Abdullah, Sheila, Sheila, I appreciate that you, ACLU. ACR, uh, where's Mr. Uh, Nunez? But anyway, Anti-Police Terror Project, Black Lives Matter, Los Angeles, as I stated, California Faculty Association, California Families for United for Justice, California United for Restorative Justice, Policy Link, Stop, Divide, Stop Coalition, and Youth Justice Coalition, and most importantly, also, the uh, Recording Industry of America the Recording Association of America, these guys stepped up. And I want to recognize one artist in particular, Aloe Black, for his courageous stand and using his platform to make sure the message got out on how important this uh, issue was. So I want to thank all of you who were involved, led your voice, led your time. Again, it's because of your tireless advocacy over the last year that we get a bill that we can all be proud of and the governor can affix his signature to. And I finally, I want to say thank you to the hundreds of individuals, families, but most importantly, Kenneth Ross family, this is his mother and his siblings here, the Quinta family, his mother and the, uh, his family here, and recognizing their tragedy, but their strong courage and support to stand with us and stand united. And I'd be remiss too if I didn't recognize some folks in law enforcement who were courageous enough to show their support today. I want to recognize Chief Cecil Rambo, LAX Police Chief, a real reformer in law enforcement. And we had Gardena's Police Chief, Mike Zafel. I don't see him anywhere, but I appreciate his presence. Despite some of the folks who are making comments, we appreciate their presence because these individuals are standing united, saying it's time for reform. 
So again, this is a major victory for California. It's a ma major victory, and it sends a message all across the nation. Thank you for being here today. And without further ado, this would all would not be possible if it wasn't for our governor agreeing to come here to sign these four pieces of legislation, but also paying tribute to Kenneth Ross, understanding that he tragically lost his life here. The governor of the state of California, Gavin Newsom. Thank you, Senator. Well, not much, uh, not much I can add uh, to the remarkable presentations and the advocacy, the hard work, the grit and determination that's reflected um, not only in the statements that were made by uh, many of our remarkable legislative leaders, but by the advocacy they uh, demonstrated over the course of many, many years. You know, God's delays are not God's denials. We had a setback last year on this critical bill with Senator Bradford, but he came back with your advocacy, with your support, uh, with the remarkable moral leadership that is assembled here today, not least of which by the most powerful force on planet Earth, mothers, uh, that um, you know, are here with tremendous, I can't imagine, grief and pain and loss, but also hopefully this provides a little hopefulness and it softens the edges a little bit that your you know, most precious, you know, your children, lives are not in vain and that their loss somehow can ennoble all of us to do more and be better and ultimately express ourselves in a way that can save other people's lives and have an impact um, in a way that does justice to the cause that unites us, which fundamentally um, is to build trust, to develop a stronger relationship, to do more and do better, to be more, to be better in terms of how we approach uh, each other each and every day. This has been hard. I, you know, I, I'm here as governor mindful that we're in the juxtaposition uh, of being a leader on police reform and a laggard on police reform. I mean, we have a lot to be proud of, but there's areas where we have nothing to brag about. California has asserted itself in certain areas, but it's remarkable that we still struggle in other areas. The Senator referenced just on this critical and important bill on decertification, there's 46 other states, 46 other states that have established foundational laws to address that issue. Why is it so hard? to do the right thing, and yet it remains still hard to do the right thing. And it's true in other areas. And last year, with the work that we did together and uh, corroded holds and challenges now with addressing the issues of, I know it's complicated when we talk about positional asphyxia, but it's very personal. The opportunity to lead in those spaces presents itself when we sign these bills, but we have work to do. Well, just because you sign a piece of legislation doesn't change things fundamentally. It's the application. Program passing is not problem solving. It's the hard work that we have to do to make real the promotion and the commitments that we are advancing here today with these five important bills. Uh, I want to acknowledge, and I appreciate they were acknowledged, uh, Assemblymember Gibson, uh, for his outstanding work and contribution to this bill package. I want to acknowledge and thank Senator Skinner uh, for her commitment. Issues of records has also been an area where California has lagged remarkably. Just transparency, access to basic and fundamental information. We finally were able to make progress on that, and I just want to thank uh, the Senator for her good work, To Some of the members joined Sawyer, this notion of modern education, modernizing policing, credentialing, and supporting and incentivizing, raising that age. This is real progress. I want to thank you, Assemblymember, for your extraordinary work. Uh, to Assemblymember Holden, who's been out front on so many of these issues for so many years, thank you as well for your demonstrable leadership, for your progress. I was with the Assemblymember uh, the last few days signing other bills that are related to this around issues of behavioral health. We put four plus billion dollars up this year 
And this matters. Your son was 25 years old. $4 billion to provide comprehensive screening, support, and services to every child 0 to 25 in the state of California. No state has done that, and I had the privilege working with these remarkable leaders to be able to advance that this year. These things are connected. It's not just about what's on surface. It's what lies beneath the surface that has to be addressed. And so we're here in that light, that spirit, and a spirit of reconciling, and a spirit uh, that brings us together to continue to, to lead and lean in uh, and to mind these gaps in terms of your expectation and our performance as a state. Uh, so with that, as I said, I, 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 I can't do any more justice than was done by the authors of the legislation to talk more detail uh, and specificity, uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge our extraordinary Attorney General, uh, who I'm very proud of, that also took the time to be here, who has always been a leader on reform, and now he's in a remarkable position of authority. Uh, to lead on that reform, and it's critical, as I said, that we're mindful of the application of this package that we have to implement, and it is critical that we have our Attorney General here who will be instrumental in advancing that cause. With that, let me quickly sign these bills and, of course, avail ourselves to any questions. Yeah, come on around. I'm going to hand these to you. I know how hard this is. Good morning. I'm the mother of Kenneth Ross Jr. My name is Miss Fazia Almaru. Thank everyone for coming out here. It really means a lot to me. Thank the Attorney General. Thank Senator Bradford. And also thank Governor Newsom. I really appreciate this bill. It really means a lot to me. My son Kenneth Ross Jr. was murdered in this park for doing nothing. All he was doing was running, and he was shot in his back with an AR-15 military assault weapon. Kenneth is my oldest son out of six children. I had him when I was 18 years old. We grew up together. He was the love of my life. I'll never see Kenneth again. This bill means a lot because it's going to stop police from attacking and targeting and being racist towards black and brown people. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of seeing mothers crying. Every day I live with this pain and agony. It won't go away. But I'm very strong, and my son's with me spiritually. That's why I'm here today, because I will fight to get justice for my son. Kenneth Ross Jr. was a very loving, kind young man. I don't need anyone saying anything bad about him in the press or the paper or something that he did, he didn't. I'm his mother. I was with him 25 years. He loved me, he loved his siblings, he has a son that he left behind. He didn't deserve this. No family deserves this. This bill is gonna protect other families. This is what it is, what happens when children get murdered by the police. This officer never got prosecuted, never. 
He never even got disciplined act. Nothing happened to him. This bill, I hope and pray, that will help many families. And I appreciate everyone coming out here. Kenneth Ross Jr., say his name. Thank you very much. I know it's hard. Um, hi, I'm Bella Orbea, um, this is Cassandra, this is Andre, uh, we're in the family of Angelo Quinto, in um, December he was having a mental health crisis, he was very afraid and paranoid, and um, the police came and um, they kneeled on his neck until he was unresponsive. Um, even the last four minutes of the restraint, he was unresponsive and they didn't address that at all. Um, and it was in front of my mom in our room. And it was just, um, it was just absolutely excessive and unnecessary and we think AB 490 is, we thank you for, for passing it so much. We think that it, it um, is long overdue. The necessity for it preceded my brother's death, it preceded George Floyd's death. Do you want to say anything? So I'm, uh, I'm Robert Collins, I'm Angelo's uh, stepdad. Um, so thank you. Um, you know, I think um, uh, the hope that we have as a family is that the legislative process has worked for us in the sense of bringing about, I think, what is needed reform. And I want to thank every elected representative who's here, representative of the people, for bringing about needed reforms in California. Angelo was not violent. He was having a mental health crisis. And that just wasn't addressed. And these bills that we're passing today and that the governor has signed today go a long way towards bringing accountability and transparency and a more just policing system that we can all, the entire community, can trust more uh, on that. And that's our goal as a family. Uh, thank you, Governor Newsom, for signing them. It is true for the mothers. This is hope that change is possible, and that means that the loss that we had is not in vain if we can prevent other people from suffering the same fate. And I also think it's a, a pro-police. We need to reform policing so that it becomes trustworthy to the community and we can work together. So I want to thank um, our family really is, is moved and wants to thank every elected official here for all the incredibly hard work that they've done this year to bring about this really needed reforms. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reverend Newsom. Thank you for signing the bill. I cannot thank you guys enough. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I will always be Angela's voice. Thank you. <laughs> That uh, should underscore the solemnity of this moment, but the hopefulness that, uh, that we're making real change here today. And so I hope we mark this moment uh, with uh, a deep recognition of what it took to get here uh, and deep respect for the families and their struggles. And so I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here. Thank you for your courage and being willing to express yourself. Uh, and to be here at this important moment. With that, um, it seems uh, 
difficult to, to ask, but we're here to answer uh, any questions you may have. Uh, Governor, Governor Newsom, Alex Michelson from Fox 11 News. Politics can sometimes be treated as a game, but ultimately politics is about people. And when you hear, and, and the same question for Senator Bradford, because both of you have worked on this issue for a long time, put in a lot of work on this issue. When you have that moment and hear from the victims like you just did on this day, what does that mean to you? What goes through your mind when you literally feel their pain as this is happening? Yeah, no, I, well, I, Senator, do, deserves to answer that question first because of his incredible advocacy. Well, it speaks to why we're here. Uh, I believe this is a job of service, and when you can serve your community and when you hear and listen to your community where those needs are, this is what brought us here today. We've heard far too many stories like this of the need for police reform, and that's why we were committed to do what we needed to do, not only with SB2, but all the other initiatives that uh, the governor assigned today. It's a critical time in California, and as elected officials, we have to be uh, paying attention and listening to our constituents, and this is what we're here for. They say you run for office for one or two reasons, to be something or do something. We're standing here today because we want to do something. This governor is here today because he's about doing something, so thank you. I'd only add, look, I, I, uh, I'm a relatively new father, so this has a different emotional attachment to me. My mom was a teenager uh, when she was pregnant with me, single mom. Um, she had done anything for me. Uh, to lose a son, lose a brother, sister, dad, I mean, that pain, that intensity, that expression is reflected not just in the words of these two remarkable women uh, and their families, but we hope reflected in this legislation. Governor Newsom, Maria Gubor from Channel 62. So this issue has been uh, through the decades, the last decades, uh, focusing sometimes about the defunded police, how that it applies right now that this law is being signed in terms of financial or that rhetoric that's been being like replied so often? Well, we're, we're, we're investing more resources in training, in modernizing our investments as it relates to organizations like POST uh, that will actually create uh, not only new curriculum and advise, but also creating a new civilian body mm -hmm. to review and adjudicate claims as it relates to excessive use uh, and misuse of force. Uh, we are committed to making those investments, and we worked. These legislative leaders worked with law enforcement to craft these bills. And while not everybody ultimately landed on the same place or the same page, uh, there was progress in that effort. And I think that's important to note. This was not done in a vacuum. This wasn't done uh, to anybody. This was done with many representatives, and there are an extraordinary number, the chief included, who's here today, you can talk to him, that are willing, not only willing, that are committed to the cause of building trust uh, and committed to the cause of reform uh, in an enlightened way. And so those are the folks we seek out, uh, the real leaders across the spectrum that are willing to work together to make progress. And look, we're not promoting perfect here, but we are promoting progress. And I would just add, um, as the governor stated, there was just a lot of negotiations that went on with this. We spent a lot of time with law enforcement, but we made our minds up. If we had a bill that law enforcement liked 100 percent, then we didn't have a bill. So we're here today because of the opposition. But I also want to recognize people who said we didn't listen to the police. I listened to a childhood friend of mine who spent 35 years with LAPD, and he's here today. And this guy was constantly in my ear telling me what we should and should not do, what is appropriate, what is not appropriate. So I just want to thank Mike Brox, a guy. Law enforcement is part of this process all the way through. So thank you, Mike, for your involvement here. And uh, I, I know that was the last question. I, let, me just, let me just end on this. What's also heartening about this, you know, last week, I think all of us were disappointed to see the bipartisan efforts in Congress fall short. Uh, Senator Booker led those efforts, Tim Scott and others, and they, they didn't materialize. And you could be left wanting 
you can be left frustrated. But I hope this provides a little bit of, uh, you know, a contrast to that anxiety and fear. We're the antidote. You know, if you don't like the old saw, if you don't like the way the world looks when you're standing up, stand on your head and go local. Remarkable things are still happening in cities and states all across this country. And so I want folks not to lose hope that just because things aren't happening in Washington, D.C., that we can't move the needle here, not only in our state, but states all across this country. Thank you all for being here. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Senator from Michigan. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. 